This season has seen the resurgence of one of the oldest tricks in the book, with Tottenham, Chelsea and Manchester City all using the false nine. But is there a reason as to why all these clubs are using it? Stick around to find out. Before we get into the details, let's first define the role of the false nine. The false nine is a unique type of centre forward. Traditionally, the number nine would be the team's focal point high up the pitch, pressing on the opposition's back line and looking to get on the end of any crosses. However, the false nine will tend to drop deep into the midfield and help with the team's possession play. He is much more involved in build-up compared to the standard striker and is tasked with the complementary role of providing through balls and freeing up space for the wide forwards and attacking midfielders to exploit. It's most effective when playing with many attacking players, such as the 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1 or 4-1-4-1 formations. Typically, when the opposition is facing a false nine, one of two things are likely to happen. The first is what creates the most danger, which is one of the centre-backs coming out of the defensive line to close down the centre-forward. By doing this, however, the wingers can exploit this gap, which can be very difficult to defend against. The second thing that can happen is that the centre-backs hold their position and sit back. Well, this can be arguably just as dangerous, as it allows the team to have more space between the lines and can allow them to overload the midfield. Depending on where the team is on the pitch, then the false nine will be positioned in a way to help the team gain ground. When in the defensive third, he can come short and collect any balls from the defensive line. In fact, the false nine is fantastic for teams wishing to use counter-attacking to their advantage. Secondly, when in the middle third, then the false nine will usually hover from side to side and create overloads in certain areas of the pitch. And when moving into the final third, the false nine will hover around the box, looking to drag centre-backs out of position and free up space for the runners either side of him or if the ball is out wide, then it can still be used as a more traditional centre forward and attempt to get on the end of any crosses. By no means an innovative tactic, the false nine was first seen as early as the 1930s with the Austrian Wunder team. Head coach Hugo Meisel opted for the use of a playmaking forward Matthias Sindelar in the number nine position and acted as the focal point of their 2-3-5 formation. And throughout history, it's been used countless times by some fantastic teams. Hedenguti in the 1950s, Johan Cruyff in the 70s, Totti in the early 2000s, and arguably the best false nine in recent history with Lionel Messi under Pep Guardiola. Let's use Lionel Messi under Pep Guardiola as an example of how effective the false nine can be going forward. Barcelona's front three in 2009 was composed of Thierry Henry, Lionel Messi and Samuel Eto'o. All three are some of the best players in the history of football. But what's interesting here is how Henri and Eto'o would line up as wide forwards in Guardiola's 4-3-3. On paper, it seems counterintuitive to have the two best centre forwards as wingers, but with Messi dropping deep, it allowed Henri and Eto'o to move into more central positions, accomplishing many things at once. Firstly, with Messi in the centre, he would be at the tip of a midfield diamond, outnumbering an opposition's three midfielders and helping the team circulate possession. Secondly, it would force one of the centre-backs to move out of position and would open up the space behind the back line. Or if the opposition shuffled their defence effectively, it would leave large gaps on the wing for the full-backs to move into and provide crosses to the forwards. So although a 4-3-3 on paper, the formation was arguably more of a 4-4-2 diamond, with Messi at the tip of this diamond. Now in 2011, Guardiola once again dominated world football with Messi as a false nine. But this time, the two wide forwards didn't move into the box as often as Henri and Eto'o. Instead, the wingers in Pedro and Villa would maintain their width, completely deserting the centre of the pitch, leaving the two centre-backs with no one to mark. By slowly moving up the pitch, Barcelona would end up having five players on the offensive line, with an extremely dynamic front three who would constantly move and shift their positioning, making it difficult for the opposition to man-mark something that was highly evident in their 3-1 win over Man United in the Champions League final. Now, in the past 10 years, Lionel Messi under Pep Guardiola is arguably one of the best examples of how effective the false nine can be. But the list doesn't end there, and in recent years, Roberto Firmino under Jurgen Klopp has been an excellent false nine. I recently did a video covering Liverpool, and if you want to know more about what's changed for them this season, then check out this video here. And that brings us to the current season, and a lot of big clubs are using the false nine. From Harry Kane at Tottenham, to Kevin De Bruyne or Gundogan at Manchester City, and Kai Havertz or Mason Mount at Chelsea. It seems to be gaining popularity once again. To understand why this could be the case, let's see how each team uses it to their advantage. This season, the partnership between Harry Kane and Son has been remarkable, with a record-breaking 14 combined goals. Even as the team's performances have tailed off, Kane has kept his standards high, as he desperately tries to drag his team into the Champions League 
and is leading the table both in assists and goals. The partnership with Son has been fluid, often switching places and giving the opposition's defence a hard time, and Spurs have been extremely lethal with Kane dropping deep into the midfield. From here he's proven to be just as excellent a passer as he is a finisher, and can pick out Son, Bergwin or Bale on the overlap. Now again, it may seem counterintuitive to have your best finisher play in a deeper playmaker position, but this could be driven by Spurs' lack of a player that could occupy this position. Since the departure of Christian Eriksen, no other player in the team has excelled in a more advanced midfield role, able to provide the precise balls that Eriksen was known for. And Kane has proven to be the answer to this issue, shifting the ball out wide before attacking the box. When looking at Chelsea and Manchester City, the adoption of the false nine is once again driven by the lack of players in a certain position. However, compared to Spurs, the issue is the complete opposite. Rather than not having a playmaker, Chelsea and City both have an excess of players in this position. However, they do seem to be lacking a more traditional number 9 that can fill the void. With Chelsea, Mason Mount, Kai Havertz, Pulisic and Ziyech are all capable of playing in more advanced central positions, as they often do during a match. But what Chelsea doesn't have is a target man. While Timo Werner has been involved in a lot of goals for the club, he hasn't exactly filled the role that was expected of him. Drifting out wide and using his pace to his advantage, but lacking the top class finishing that is expected from a player in his position. And at the same time, Giroud and Tammy Abraham, although more traditional number nines, do not seem to fit in Tuchel's plans for the team going forward. Similarly, at Manchester City, De Bruyne, Foden and Gundogan are all excellent playmakers, but the constantly injured Aguero and Gabriel Jesus has forced Pep to go back to his 2011 false nine tactics with an excess of creative players around the box, but no specific target man for the opposition to use as a reference. So the increased usage rate of a false nine could be driven by the lack of players in a certain position. However, if we take a look at the general trends of football tactics, then the reasoning behind the usage of a false nine becomes even more clear. Over the past few seasons, the majority of teams are choosing to press high up the pitch, and as a result are also playing with a very high defensive line. For a team to overcome an offensive press, the easiest way around this is to create a man advantage in possession, and a false nine is perfect for making this happen. For example, in a 4-3-3, the centre forward can come closer to the midfield line, and can help outnumber the opposition's midfield in a 4v3. The wingers could then attack the space left by one of the centre backs if he chooses to join the midfield, or he can stay wide to help the defence transition out of the defensive third. In this scenario, the centre forward can then choose to overload on the flanks and create even more space down the middle, or for a switch of play to the other winger. Another tactic that is increasingly more common is possession football. Teams are a lot less reliant on long balls, and will look to build up play from the goalkeeper as much as possible. And, once again, the false nine is essential for teams who wish to do this, given that he can create overloads in midfield and help the team gain ground. So, the usage of a false nine could be down to different factors the lack of a playmaker at Spurs or the lack of a striker at Man City and Chelsea. But it could also be down to the changing football trends. And as we've seen, a lot of clubs press from the front and play with a high defensive line. And an excellent way of countering this is adding more numbers to the midfield, something that the false nine excels in. And now let me know what you think. Do you think the false nine is going to increase in popularity over the next few seasons or is there a tactic that everyone is sleeping on? Let me know in the comments down below, along with any suggestions for future videos. And if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And hey, if you're still watching, surely that means that you enjoy my content or you've fallen asleep and forgot to turn your phone off. Either way, I think you might enjoy my Instagram page as well. I post statistical updates on players that I enjoy watching, along with any updates for videos that I post on this channel. And if you want to get in touch, Instagram is the best place to do that, as I read every message that my fans send me. So if you think it's something you might enjoy, give me a follow on Instagram as well. The link is in the description down below. Thanks for watching.